Right, welcome everyone. My name is Alex Bryson. I'm chair of this special session on ethnic wage gaps. We have three excellent speakers. We're going to start with Steve Nolan, Liverpool, John Moore, followed by Carl Singleton and then John Forth. Um, please ask your questions through the Q&A box and we will take questions as they come on points of clarification. However, each speaker is going to try and stick to 20 minutes and then there'll be five minutes of questions after their presentation. And if we do that, then there'll be five or 10 minutes at the end of the session as well to ask uh, general questions. So without further ado, over to you, Steve Nolan. Thanks for that, Alex. Uh, thanks for everyone uh, for coming. So I'm going to be talking today uh, on my paper, co-written with Ken Clark on the change in the distribution of the male ethnic pay gap in Britain over about the last 30, well, nearly 30 years. Um, so just to say that this paper was written under the auspices of, of the Centre for Dynamics of Ethnicity at University of Manchester and through a grant with the ESRC. So what's the area we're looking at? Well, obviously, there's a, already a large uh, existing literature on the UK ethnic pay gap that's developed over the last 30, 40 years. And we know quite a lot. Uh, of stuff, but mostly focusing on differences at the mean. So we know about differences in certain ethnic groups, for instance, Indian Chinese males tend to have a lower ethnic pay gap, even in some cases, than premium compared to uh, workers in Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Black African, Black Caribbean groups. And so that's going to miss out some important details in the nature of the gap. And specifically, one of the things we'll focus on today is this idea that kind of identified in the gender pay gap literature of sticky floors and glass ceilings. What we see when we can look across the full distribution, almost at the tails of it. At the, at the lower end, we have like a sticky floors effect where low paid workers can struggle to move away from that low paid work. The, the top end glass ceilings, probably a more commonly known parlance, uh, where there's almost a limit to what certain minorities, be it gender minorities or ethnic minorities, how high they can go on the pay scale. So given this is a kind of a clear need to analyze the distribution beyond just the means, and there's policy implications as well. Um, tackling the ethnic wage gap has been rhetorically a government policy since as long as I've been alive, 1976. But even though there have been many reports, many policy recommendations, many policy initiatives, there's kind of little consistent evidence that uh, they have served to close the ethnic pay gap. So looking at things beyond the mean, what the things are happening at different points in the pay scale may actually help to reveal why there have been some policy failures over time, but also might reveal, have there been some un unrecognized policy effects? Um, for instance, in a more general labour market policy, like the national minimum wage, what's the effect of that on uh, the ethnic pay gap? We might expect, given that there's a great tendency for ethnic minority workers to be found at the bottom end of the distribution, that lower, the increasing uh, floor should aid to close the gap. So we are interested in looking in that. So given that, sorry, given that the contributions we were look, uh, looking to make is to a good sort of documentation of the change in the ethnic pay gap across the distribution over 26 years, so 1993 to 2019. And then from headline results, kind of look underneath the hood, do a detailed decomposition to reveal the nature of disadvantages faced by different ethnic groups. And within this uh, decomposition, we wanted to look at how changing policy uh, differs by ethnic groups and specifically looking at how the introduction of the national minimum wage has had differential impacts on different ethnic groups. And as a preview of some forthcoming contractions, some of the headline results that we, we have in the paper, we can find it on a, like a good news story for Indians and relatively poorly paid Bangladeshi males. They experience a, a recognizable reduction in the ethnic pay gap, which we find is consistent with an improving wage structure. On the less positive side, we're finding some pretty compelling evidence of uh, an apparent glass ceiling effect for most ethnic groups and particularly for Black African and Black Caribbeans. And then when we look at the national minimum wage, we see some interest in heterogeneity. There's, there is, seems to be some improvement at the lower end, but only for some ethnic groups. 
So to look at this, uh, we went to the quarterly labour force survey. It's been uh, taking labour force data since 1993 uh, consistently. And so we have 105 quarters of data to play with going from 1993 up to 2019. And from that, we just construct to look at the ethnic pay gap, we kind of standardly create, create a variable of hourly wages. So the reported gross weekly hours, uh, sorry, gross weekly pay divided by the number of hours reported. And we do this for both full time and part time workers. Now, the latter part is really important because previous research has shown that certain ethnic groups are, tend to have a greater share of their workers in part time work but specifically Bangladeshi and Pakistani. So it's important for us to include that into our survey because we wanted consistent reporting from back from 1993, we chose to choose our ethnic groups. We relied on what were the questions that were asked consistently over time. And for that reason, we've got kind of the six main ethnic groups we focus on. Uh, that's white, Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Black African and Black Caribbean. Now you'll notice that the Chinese male workers are missing from there because we faced sample size issues and the results were not reliable enough to include, unfortunately. So to track the changes over time, we've partitioned our data into four time periods and deciding what time periods was a kind of trade-off between how large, how narrow we wanted the time period, but how large the sample size to get significant effects for smaller ethnic groups. And so we went on these time periods here. Now throughout in the paper itself, we look at all four periods, but for most of the time today, I'll be focusing on the first period, 1993 to 99 and 2014 to 2019. So given that, we can have a first look at the data. So this is the ethnic pay gap in log hourly wages for our four time periods across our five ethnic minority groups. And so to interpret this, we see here in period one, 1993 to 99, a positive ethnic pay gap essentially means that the white, white worker on average is earning more than an Indian worker. So we see here there's a pay disadvantage for Indian work, Indian male workers. But the story is over time, it, it progressively we, uh, narrows and in fact turns into a pay premium for, for Indian male workers. And this trend we can see again with both Pakistan, uh, Pakistani and Bangladeshi workers. Now, clearly there's a difference in magnitude. We, uh, Pakistani and even more so Bangladeshi male workers are facing a much higher pay penalty in comparison to Indian, Indian workers but that there is an ongoing trend of some kind of improvement. And we actually see the reverse at much smaller magnitudes for Black Caribbean and Black African. There's some sign of a reversal for Black African, but overall the gap has been widening for those two groups. So there's some interesting things already here at the mean, but we wanted to look in under the hood even more. So if we look across the distribution, we see some interesting results. So to interpret these graphs here, what we've got is for each minority group, the share of that minority group in comparison to the decile wage of the white group. So for instance, for the first decile here in 1993, 1999, it basically means we've got about 13% of our sample of Indian male workers are on a wage below uh, the wage of the Indian, sorry, the, the white male, male worker at the, first decile. And so what we see is if there was complete inequality between the two groups, Indians and whites, we basically have just a, a, almost a rectangle for 10% 10, 10 for each decile. Any variation from that was revealing some kind of interesting inequality. So for instance, in our first period where we saw uh, a, net, a positive wage gap against it, the disadvantaged Indians, uh, it seems to be driven from the lower end of the distribution here. And we see that that distribution noticeably changes over our time periods, ending up bimodal here in 2007 to 2013. Now you'll recall from the previous graph uh, that in this period, we basically saw no uh, ethnic wage gap at all, but that overall figure uh, was hiding some kind of interesting stuff. So at the bottom end here, we still get quite considerable hate, uh, uh, inequality in the white's favor, 
but also some inequality at the top end in favour of Indians. And it's this kind of uh, differentiation across the distribution that really kind of justifies looking at it in a more broad way. So to do that more formally, we kind of borrow and take on board the quantile disc decomposition technique. Just a generalization of the standard Ohaka blinder method, but done across a full distribution. So we've estimated this using the distribution uh, regression technique techniques. Broadly, what we do is we get the estimate, uh, estimate uh, the, the regression process for our white group, and then take our observable characteristics for our ethnic group that gives us a counterfactual distribution. Once we have those three distributions, a distribution of wages for the whites, for our ethnic group, and then our counterfactual, it allows us to decompose things into both characteristics effect and coefficient effects. So coefficient effects are the kind of standard wage structure, the unexplained kind of things. So given that, these are the first headline results. So we're gonna see these figures quite a bit. So let's explain it. What we've got here is this black bar is the total line. And this is for every quantile, uh, all 99 of them uh, across the distribution, the wage gap. And again, we see it's positive in this early period. So this is white workers are earning more than Indian workers. But we also have the results of our decomposition. Our blue line here is the characteristics effects. And then we have the wage structure effects, the coefficient here. We've got our confidence intervals to 95% uh, done by bootstrapping. We've, all, we've suppressed them here on the total lines to make it easier to read. So what we see is if the Indian workers were essentially facing the same wage structure as their white counterparts, essentially they should be being paid more at mo almost every point in the distribution. And, and to an extent that's increasing as we move up into the more highly paid. That they're not is almost entirely down to the wage structure that they face. And that's what leads to this positive wage gap here. But what we then see over time, moving up into our late, late period, is that wage gap is pretty much gone. At the lower effects, it's now zero. And at high, higher up the distribution, we're beginning to see a wage premium for Indian workers. And as we can see, that's broadly down to a change in the wage structure. You could interpret this as less kind of structural impediment to Indian workers in this respect. When we move on to Pakistani workers, it's not as positive a picture. Overall, we see that at the total level, a persistent wage gap increases. And for the most part, that is driven by the coefficients effect. It's driven by the wage structure. There is clearly a, some improvement over time, mostly in the bottom half of the distribution. Some of that driven by uh, an improvement in characteristics, the makeup of uh, the sample we have, but a lot of it driven by the coefficients effect. Now, what we're beginning to see here is a shape in our coefficients line, which will become more and more familiar. It's generally upward sloping. And we're beginning to see signs of that glass ceiling effect I talked about at the beginning. If we look at Bangladeshi workers now, we see again, as we saw in, at the mean, quite the largest uh, levels of inequality at the total line, especially in our first period here. But in terms of characteristics, quite similar effects to the Pakistanis. Some similar improvement at the lower end uh, over the, the periods. And we also see a fall in the coefficients effect here. It seems that most of the improvement for the Bangladeshi is coming from a change in wage structure. But what we're really beginning to see here is this clear upward sloping effect. This glass ceiling effect. Basically what we're seeing is the more we move up the distribution, the more that we're seeing there's a increase in the gap between white workers and our ethnic minorities that can't be explained by the characteristics. Basically it's specifically as it's talked about in the literature as a kind of glass ceilings effect. Steve, you've had, you've had 15 minutes, okay? Okay, thank you. If we look at the results for Black Caribbean here, we see that they're fairly stable over time. Um, and also at the bottom end, really no kind of uh, 
a noticeable wage gap. So it seems like there is almost a level playing field. But once again, we see a persistent, in the case of Black Caribbean, and as we find in the paper, an increasing glass ceilings effect. Moving on to our final results here for Black Africans, they're noticeable for the only being the only ethnic group where we're actually seeing an increase in the gap uh, over time. We see it's much wider here, uh, totally. But interestingly, a lot of that seems to be driven by changing characteristics. The, what the characteristics effect is much narrower here. Actually, the coefficients effect doesn't seem to be driving any of the increase here. But what we do see, once again, is that persistent glass ceilings effect. So one of the key takeaways from the paper is we find this kind of persistent structural impediment to higher wages, specifically for the Black and African and Black Caribbean workers. So in the paper from those headline results, we kind of do standard decomposition using the recentered re influence function method, looking at the available characteristics to explain what's driving our characteristics effect. Um, what we also do is test the effect of this national minimum wage policy on it by adding that in as a specific variable in our RAF regressions. By that I mean, for every respondent, we take the national minimum wage level, uh, rebased uh, to 2010, um, to, that would be available to that respondent. So what would be the national minimum wage that they would be work, they would be allowed if they were working at that time that they were interviewed? And we take all the data and put it into one single pool here, basically to get as much variation as possible in that national minimum wage. And the variation comes twofold. It comes across uh, cross-sectionally by the difference in ages. As we can see here, there's never been one minimum wage. It's always varied by age, but it also varies across time. So once we include that, we can get results like this. So what we're looking at here is essentially what is the influence of uh, on hourly wage of a small change in the unconditional average of the minimum wage. As we see, most of the effect for our Indian, uh, Indian male workers is at the bottom end of the distribution, but it's matched entirely by what's happening with white workers. So we're not actually seeing an effect on the pay gap here. We're seeing an expected change in the level for both groups, but there's no differentiation. And it's a similar story with Black African workers as well. No significant effect on the ethnic pay gap. For Black Africans, we're actually seeing a possible increasing of it, uh, though obviously the confidence intervals are quite high here. So looking at the data under the hood of this, what we're seeing actually is for the lower quantile of these three groups, um, the ethnic pay gap is either negative or statistically insignificant. So it means that this, the distribution structure at that area is quite similar across these groups. So we actually probably shouldn't be surprised that the minimum wage isn't having an impact here. It's a different story when we consider the Pakistani groups here. Um, then we're definitely seeing a significant difference. You can see here that the impact on Pakistani hourly wages is much is higher than that for whites, indicating a narrowing of the ethnic pay gap. And similarly, following the pattern that we've seen throughout uh, the paper, uh, we're seeing an even larger effect for Bangladeshi. So it's an indication that these broad kind of policies can have some effect on the ethnic wage gap overall. Okay, so as I'm coming to the end now, just to summarize, we really wanted to look at what's going on over time and across distribution for our various different, different ethnic groups. And one of the key takeaways from the paper for us was that at certain points, at, every, at certain points, every group experiences some form of glass ceiling, but it's significantly so for black workers and it seems to be increasing over time. And we also saw that like taking this policy and putting it into the detailed composition, we able to reveal the association between reducing, increasing the minimum wage and reducing the pay gap for Pakistani and Bangladeshis. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much indeed, Steve. Time for questions. We've got a couple um, submitted. Um, but Carl, is there anybody in your room 
that has also got a question. I'm just asking Alex. <laughs> OK, well, let's start with the ones in the chat. So we've got, first of all, we've got a question about whether you ever at any point, Steve, distinguish between white British and white other. And then a second question about whether there are any limitations around the ethnicity data from the Labour Force survey that could either have resulted in an under or over estimate of the gaps that you identify. Right, so in terms of white other, we did look into that um, and like did the regression with it and there didn't seem to be any significant difference from the results that we had. In terms of reporting of the data, uh, in terms of the ethnicity, nothing that we considered would be an issue. I mean, they're fairly standard questions going back to 1993. Okay. So in that, I mean, Tanya, we did, sorry. Yeah, Tanya Wilson asked a follow-up question around that saying, oh, what about self-employed earnings? Is this an issue for your analysis? And of course we can think about about discrimination and the propensity to be right yes yeah yes so i mean obviously it's kind of there are problems with that and we do we did do a checked again with bringing in any kind of reported hourly wages in that respect because obviously there's a risk of skewing that way we didn't see any significant effect i mean obviously it's an issue um in that like self-employed is kind of an issue in that respect but um it's definitely one i think probably to look at again okay carl you've got a question in the room yeah do you want to speak up and see if they pick it up yeah sure hi can you hear us yes we can fantastic um my question is more around the integration of these ethnic groups prior to 1993 mm -hmm. so as you're probably aware a lot of the ethnic groups which you've highlighted um integrated in britain um within the uk a lot sooner than others um, would you say that's a contributing factor? Is that something which you guys considered when looking at the data? Well, I mean, I think in terms of if considering at the level of including region in uh, as an explanatory variable, um, it definitely factors in in that respect. But it also factors in if we look in the paper, the kind of different almost demographic makeup where people where like different groups are in proportion throughout the country and we see certain changes in that and that might possibly be explaining some of the stuff we see for the black african uh, uh group how they're the only group that where the, the situation is worsening over time we think that might be actually a kind of a compositional effect that we're obviously uh, there's a different kind of group of people moving in from that area. But they like part of the idea of the paper is taking into account that these things are fluid over time as well. I mean, more broadly, Steve, you've done a great job in mapping some new empirical regularities, both across ethnicity and across the wage distribution. But the question why <laughs> behind this heterogeneity, I suspect will come up in the next couple of papers as well. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I mean, there's, there's not a lot of theory to go with, is there here? I mean, it's interpretation of these results the, in, in respect to the why question is pretty tough, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think it, it, I think it is. I mean, like, obviously, we try to consider what's driving things. Like in the paper, we do a bit more on detailed uh, effects and a lot a lot of it is education it is driving a lot of a lot of it and as if another thing with kind of notable thing is and that's true for pretty much every group and pretty much consistently across the time periods apart from black caribbeans where there's no real significant effect across the, across the distribution yeah the yeah i thought education was probably one of the, the key factors and, and hence why i asked that question because if you're um, ultimately, if you're part of an organisation or a company for a lot longer than uh, another individual coming in six years later, you're yep. used to the policy, you're used to the national wage, you, your understanding of um, kind of the, the the pay and that way you kind of stand is is a lot more clearer. Uh, whereas if you're just coming into the UK, you might do uh, the same level of work for a lot cheaper and not question it for X amount of years. So yeah, I, I can see where you guys have highlighted that. Yeah, but we also like look at job tenure as well, 
um, which doesn't have a strong effect, but like um, in a, a similar kind of way. One last very quick question we have in the Q&A um, from Shuai Shen is, what about, can you actually study East Asians as a group if the Chinese sample is limited? Did you ever do that? And is that possible? Yeah, I mean, it is possible um, and it, it is worth doing, but we didn't do it in that way. It just was almost kind of getting more one that they're not that narrow groups, but it's getting as narrow as we as the data could allow. And and it would have been we've been wrong to include our results for the Chinese because it was just it, I don't want to tell a story that's not there. Okay, fair enough. Steve, thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Um, that's that. Over to Carl Singleton next, who's going to talk about the, again the distribution of ethnic pay gaps, but this time bringing in the role of the firm. Okay, thank you. I presume you can see that, Alex. You shout at me if you can't. Yeah, we can see it. Thanks, Carl. Right, thanks. So I should warn people who are watching this online that I'm actually in the room here, so I might be hand waving because I might descend into lecture mode, I'm afraid. Um, okay, so the first thing you'll notice about this paper is there's a lot of co-authors. Um, you might be thinking that's too many co-authors for something that's going to be explained in 20 minutes or so. Um, but the reason why there are so many co-authors is because this is part a small output from a very big project that I've been working on with Alex and John, who are both here and, and others, um, where we've been trying to add a lot of value to existing social sciences uh, research data sets uh, for the UK by forming new administrative linkages uh, between those data sets, uh, supported by the Administrative Data Research UK and the SRC and a lot of partners, Office for National Statistics and other government bodies. And uh, today's talk, uh, as well as answering an important question, I'm hoping gives you some flavor of the value added that we're, do we're, we're providing uh, through those uh, new data linkages. It's gonna be a very, very similar paper to, uh, to Steve's in, in a sense. We're gonna look at the distribution of ethnicity wage gaps, uh, and we're gonna demonstrate one of those linkages. We're gonna take the employer-employee linked annual survey of hours and earnings, payroll-based data, as opposed to household-based data. And we've linked that to the census. Uh, so bringing a lot more information about these employees' demographic characteristics uh, to, to look into this, uh, to look into these ethnicity wage gaps through the distribution. So uh, Steve's already done the, the, the motivation uh, to some extent, but I'm going to motivate it a slightly different way from the perspective of bringing firms into the study. So I would perhaps argue that uh, if you that the firm, to some extent, in a wage model, trying to understand uh, wage gaps or wage inequality, in a lot of studies that are based just on household survey data, they're an omitted factor, they're an omitted variable. Who you work for can matter, uh, firm-specific wage determination. Usually studies might have a few controls, covariates, firm size, maybe the sector that the firm's in, but the actual identity of the firm and seeing multiple workers working for the same firm is an omitted factor in, these, uh, in, this, in this literature. And one exception to that, as well as this paper that I'm gonna present, is coming in the next talk in this session uh, from John. And as I'm sure many people here know, there's an increasing recognition, though, that firms are pay setters. They have wage setting power uh, and increasingly wage setting power. And a lot of studies of dynamics of wage inequality, uh, the aggregate and also between different groups uh, have shown that increasingly those dynamics are being driven by between firm inequality, as opposed to rises in residual wage inequality within firms. I'm sure again, we'll all know as well that there's a lot of evidence that the firm matters from correspondence studies, uh, particularly from the UK, uh, a vast, a vast uh, amount of evidence there. And if that, that evidence is coming back that discrimination probably matters at the hiring margin, that implies that firms are having some specific role in determining, uh, potentially determining wage gaps because that relates to firm entry, access to particular jobs and firms. And there's also some evidence I've contributed to that for the gender wage gap in the UK, the identity of the firm that you work for, i.e. do you work for a high or a low wage firm, one that pays all its work as a high wage as opposed to a low wage, matters more for the gender wage gap on average than occupations do in the UK. Um, others have shown that for other countries as well recently. So our contributions are threefold, uh, we think, we hope. So first of all is the generic general contribution of what we're doing with these data linkages. Uh, that we're uh, augmenting the largest employer employee panel data set in the UK already, the annual survey of hours and earnings, and we're adding in a lot more information about those employees because the ASH itself contains very little information about who these workers are. We're, the ASH provides very accurate payroll data straight from employers' payrolls 
um, uh, and, and all the different components of uh, work uh, and hours worked, not self-reported. Uh, it contains detailed occupational classifications provided by the firm, not the worker. Uh, and tenure, and obviously the identity of the firms, can be linked to all the business survey data sets as well, which we're also doing. Um, and then we're adding in the census. We're getting ethnicity from there because that only gender and age are in the ash. Uh, and then we're getting in loads of other important covariates for wages that would be in the labor force survey, but would not have been in this payroll data set before. So we're getting education for the first time in a payroll data set. We're getting family circumstances. Are you married? Is your partner working? Uh, how many children have you got? Age of the dependent children. So, and then our second contribution then taking this new data set is we're gonna do much the same as what Steve has, has done, uh, but we're only gonna do it for that one year in 2011. And we're gonna examine ethnicity wage gaps uh, across the distribution of these basic hourly payroll wages. I'm gonna look by different ethnic groups uh, and then compare to white workers. And then we're gonna add in these firm specific wage determinants. How much does it matter perhaps what firms workers are, are getting into or are working at? And hopefully we think this provides some novel insights uh, into the firm's role in ethnicity wage gaps in England and Wales throughout the wage distribution, kind of gives some indication about how biased wage gap decomposition estimates could be without accounting for who the firm is, uh, if you don't have that information. Uh, and it also demonstrates what we can do with this new linked uh, payroll census data set. So a little bit more detail about this data. So this is the annual survey of hours and earnings. So as I said, linked to the 2011 census. It doesn't have a name yet. We're probably going to call it ASH census. We're probably not going to be that uh, imaginative about it. It's a 1% sample of employee jobs from the ASH, data provided by the employer, and you get around 0.6% uh, of employee jobs varying over the period. It can go back all the way to the 70s. So even though we've done this linkage in 2011, we can map this forward 10 years, and we can map it back 30 years, potentially, with a lot of attrition. The ASH itself, though, does track the same people over time. It's based on national insurance number. If you've got a national insurance number ending in X, I won't say what it is, you should be in this data set, in theory, when you've got an employee job uh, over time. Uh, ONS, Office of National Statistics, linked this data using the census, using names, information in the census that you also have based on PAYU records uh, and about the firms. Uh, and the match rate was a bit less than you might expect because of names, actually. Uh, names are not as consistently recorded as you might imagine. And even names on the ash were quite often missing. But the, ma the match rate we got was around only, well, it was 60% of employees in 2011. And then we found it out. We used information from 2010, 2012 to improve the matching. And, and we're still working on that uh, to some extent. Um, but the data set's going to be released very soon in its present format uh, for everybody to, to play with and work with. So there could be some potential non-random linkage between these two data sets because the ASH in theory is random, but the linkage might not be that we have addressed. Uh, we will be generating some weights that are available to researchers uh, to address that. And we've checked and compared earnings statistics and distributions from this new data set with what you find in the labor force survey and the annual population survey, and they are remarkably, well, I'm not, I'm not gonna be able to show you today, but they're remarkably consistent, particularly the shape of these wage distributions that you get from household survey data sets compared to the payroll data. So we're only going to today, we're not going to, we're going to ignore the panel in the ash. We're not going to get that complicated, I'm afraid, because um, of the attrition problem. But, uh, and we not, haven't, haven't looked at whether there's um, non-random attrition over time in this ash census linkage. Uh, we're going to focus on 2011. We're going to focus on England and Wales, because that's where we've been able so far to do this ash census linkage. We're going to bring women in as well, compared to Steve's paper, um, to boost our sample. Uh, we're going to look at full and part-time workers. And then we do have a slightly bigger sample here. So we're going to add Chinese ethnic minority group uh, relative to what uh, as Steve uh, was doing with the labor force survey. So, uh, and then just to say the units of what I mean by a firm, because I should always be very specific here because people mean very different things by firm across all this different literature about the firm specific determinants of wages. Firms for us are the administrative enterprise. That's the enterprise as re recorded on the interdepartmental business register. Typically, you can think of that as it being Tesco or Tesco supermarkets, as opposed to Tesco banking. Maybe that's in a different enterprise, but Tesco supermarkets, but meaning you're getting variation over plants and local units as well. So you're picking up multi-site firms, which means you can still identify the influence of location as well as the influence of the firm specific. Um, typically, uh, the literature, who's, which is used, the actually tend to think about the enterprise as a 
approximately the level where you'd expect pay, uh, pay, per, pay policies to be set and uh, specific pay, pay determination policies, et cetera. Okay, so, uh, the sample design, uh, you're probably thinking, well, how are you gonna bring firms into this? Well, we're not gonna do it too sophisticated in a way uh, because we don't actually have that many employees within some firms. Yes, we're gonna have a lot of employees within some firms, and I shouldn't say the names of those firms, but we all know probably who they are. Um, and but then as we get smaller and smaller firms, really we're going to be really running out of people within firms to compare against each other to compare their wages. But we do have firms. We have workers linked within those firms for, for a cross section of the 2011 labour market. We're not going to do within and between firm specific components of wage gaps like uh, uh, Carter et al. have done for gender pay, gender wage gap, uh, gaps in more in larger samples of administrative data. Instead, we're only going to estimate. Uh, an average residual firm specific wage and the best way to think of that is it's going to be a firm wage effect in the models which is just fixed over all the employees within that firm uh, and as i've just said the sample becomes a little bit biased towards larger firms because well you need to see two workers in the firm otherwise you can't identify or we can't label something a firm specific wage effect at least two workers within the firm should i say our preferred measure of wages is the basic hourly wage that is taking everything else out, what's your basic rate of pay or what's your hourly rate of pay or what's your basic salary level, taking out supplementary pay over time. I think I prefer that measure as a way of looking at inequality or particularly the place where you might expect uh, to be able to more easily interpret when you see differences in that rate of pay within the firm as something to do with discrimination, as opposed to perhaps sort of people having different working patterns over time, uh, supplementary pay because of working on bank holidays, et cetera. Uh, and other pay, other pay components. We also do look in the paper when it's written, it's coming soon, uh, gross earnings per hour is a robustness check as well. Uh, so then we've got from the ash, we've got gender, age, where people live, only the nuts one region, we're gonna have tenure, part-time status, and we're gonna throw in the occupation as well, because we don't want, you know, occupation scopes clearly correlated with firms, so we don't want it to be driven by occupation. We wanna see whether it's residually firms as opposed to occupations that are maybe explaining some of these gaps. Uh, and then from the census, we're bringing in ethnicity, uh, measure of education, marital status, the number of children in the household, uh, actually, I'm sorry, I should be specific, the family, the age of the youngest child, and whether the individual was non-UK born. Okay, right, so um, we're gonna go to distributions, but we should start with the mean. Um, so I've highlighted in the center here, uh, uh, some mean wage statistics for white employees from our new ASH census data set. The first two columns are, are the ASH census. The final column is a comparator with the annual population survey uh, for the same period. So uh, the first thing actually to point out perhaps is the Ns that we're getting, right? The sample sizes that we're getting for this ASH census data set, comparing it to the annual population survey, which if you know is a combined uh, combination of four, four different waves of uh, labor force survey respondents boosted as well uh, in some areas of the country. So we're getting, uh, for example, Chinese in our data set, the Chinese ethnic minority group, we're getting 379, whereas in the annual population survey for the same period, we're getting less than half of that uh, in terms of employees specifically. Uh, so we are getting a bigger sample size from this by, uh, for some uh, for ethnic minority groups just for the 2011 period uh, for England and Wales. Looking at these average wages, what we were particularly uh, happy to find was the two ash columns, the ordering of the wages and the wage gaps. Uh, is similar or exactly the same across ethnic groups as we'd find in the annual population survey. We've been a bit concerned if we found something completely different because then that would go back to concerns about a non-random linkage of these two data sets. And in fact, the kind of magnitudes are relatively similar as well, uh, reasonably. Now, I'm going to mess with everybody's heads a little bit because I'm going to flip around the gaps, I'm afraid, for the rest of the talk relative to what the last presentation showed. So a positive gap is going to be ethnic minority minus white workers, uh, a statistic related to the ethnic minority group and the white group, uh, and the negative is going to be uh, the other way around uh, for effectively a penalty. Okay, so there's a mean, but we've got, we'll, we'll have a lot of stuff in the paper about looking at the mean, we'll do everything that we do for the different quantiles at the mean as well, but for the rest of this talk, I'm going to go, go into the distribution. You've had, to, uh, you've had 15 minutes, Carl, okay? All right, okay. Right, so uh, here's some stacked percentages. It, sh it shows something similar to what Steve showed earlier about the relative distribution of people throughout the wage distribution. So I'm gonna skip over that. Um, 
we go in beyond the mean with decomposing differences in uh, an ethnic minority wage distribution relative to a white wage distribution. This is just a graphical illustration of that. Um, and uh, what we're doing is we're taking gaps at different quantiles. Uh, and again, uh, I'm going to lean heavily on what Steve's already explained because we're using very similar methodology. I'll flip through this other than to say that the main difference uh, in our wage regressions for each quantile, these RIF regressions, is that we're incorporating uh, uh, the, the phi term in the, in the regression. In, in, in particular, we're introducing a wage effect from the fact that two workers work in the same firm, and then we can call that a firm-specific wage effect in the model. Um, we then do the same kind of counterfactual exercise as you saw before, and we're going to project uh, a counterfactual for the, for, the main, for the firm fixed effect component. So we have the first line here is the quantile dif difference between quantiles, and we've got the coefficients effect, again, from the differential labor market returns that people get for particular characteristics. Then we've got the characteristics effect, the normal uh, different ethnic minority groups have different distributions over age and tenure and occupations. The firm fixed effects component, we're gonna get from projecting and estimating firm specific wage effects for white workers, in a particular firm, and then projecting those onto the ethnic minority employees, the uh, projecting those onto the ethnic minority employees. So it's going to give us this, a sense of the extent to which uh, the wage gaps are determined by the different distribution of workers over these firm specific wage effects that white workers can earn if they're in those firms. Okay. So um, our, our distribution of ethnic wage gaps, we do this for particular quantiles. As I said, I'm gonna mess with your heads a bit. I flipped it around relative to Steve. So we've got the big Chinese uh, relative wage premium uh, across the wage distribution. Uh, in the positive, we also have uh, for Indian workers, a relative wage premium for high quantiles uh, for Pakistani, Bangladeshi and black African employees, relative disadvantage, which is growing. Uh, for the reasons that Steve mentioned, probably because of the minimum wages influence, but it's growing across, partly because of the minimum wage influence, but it's growing across the, uh, the percentiles. And then uh, the Black Caribbean group has a relative wage premium at particular percentiles uh, to white workers uh, up, to the, up to the median, and then a, a relative wage disadvantage, uh, with, uh, comparing respective percentiles of the wage distributions. So uh, for the Indian white wage gap, starting there, this was a group that towards the top of the wage distribution, the 90th percentile of Indian men is earning more than the 90th, oh, sorry, not just men, 90th percentile of Indian employees is earning more than the 90th percentile of white employees. That's given by this solid black line. Then we've got the specific contribution of the firm. Now, what you can see with this blue solid line, which tracks the contribution of those firm fixed effects, that the reason why those wages are higher towards the top of the wage distribution amongst Indian employees the vast majority of that is accounted for this previously omitted variable, which is who you work for. You know, Ind Indians are accessing towards the top of the distribution where they earn high wages relative to the 90 percentile men. It's because they're getting access to uh, firms which pay higher wages to all their workers in general. And that, that means, though, that what would previously have been attributed to characteristics effects, the influence of education, etc., was being overestimated overestimated because it correlates with access to those particular firms, ability, uh, staying in those jobs in those firms. So what you see on the right hand side here of this graph is the contributions to the black line. The solid line is the contribution from characteristics effects once we've controlled for the firm fixed effects. And then the dashed line was what we would have got if we hadn't controlled for the firm fixed effects. And you can see that that's massively, well, relatively over, overestimated because you've not accounted for these co the correlations between getting into high wage firms and having characteristics which allow you and access to keeping it staying, getting into those jobs or staying in those jobs. Uh, the Chinese white wage gap has much the same pattern, uh, where a large amount reason for that, a large part of the reason for those relative wage premiums through the distribution is again towards to do with accessing high wage firms. And again, uh, on the right hand panel, you're seeing a difference between that dash line, dash red line, and the solid red line again, showing an overestimation that you would find without accounting for the firm, an overestimation of how much was being driven by education, for example, or occupations. We've got more detailed decompositions of that difference in the paper, but for now, well, we don't really have time to go into it. Pakistani, uh, Bangladeshi, are very fast, and Black Africans uh, groups generally 
uh, the role of firms is relatively small. This blue line is not accounting for much of those relative wage gaps uh, through the distribution. Uh, Bangladesh here is moderating the wage gaps towards the top. Um, and the Black Caribbean is relatively interesting in terms of that there's absolutely no uh, effect to the firm wage effects towards the top of the distribution. And even uh, after accounting for the firms, there's no contribution towards the top, uh, similar to what Steve showed from the characteristics effect. There are, there are the, the wage gaps towards the top of the Black Caribbean white uh, wage gap uh, distributions are, are accounted for by uh, the different labor market structure, the returns to the returns, uh, the wage returns to particular characteristics in the labor market. Okay, so summing up very quickly with a lot of text on the slide. I've, um, yeah, I'm used to my students not turning up to my lectures, so I have to put everything on the slides. Sorry, bad habit. So uh, ethnicity wage gaps vary greatly by groups and across the wage distribution, as we saw from Steve's presentation. We're confirming that as well with a new data set from the UK. Third specific wage effects, we think really contribute, and uh, they tend to contribute in very different ways across ethnic groups and, and across the wage distribution. And firm specific wage effects um, for some groups and in some parts of the wage distribution tend to account for sizable parts of the gaps that you would otherwise have attributed to observable characteristics such as education, such as region, such as occupation, um, which were actually really hope probably accounted for more by accessing top, uh, top wage, high wage firms, uh, high or low, relatively high wage firms. Okay, so next steps for this project um, related to, or this part of the project is we're decomposing further these contributions of the firm specific wage effects. We've, I've already done it, but I can't show the results yet. Um, but in general, um, the, the, these other aspects, is it private, is it public, is it big, small firms? That doesn't seem to matter very much, to be honest. It doesn't account for these firm patterns. Um, and then we're going to look at the role played by religion because we have that from the census. We have local labor markets. We know where people work and where they uh, where they live. It's great data in that regard. We can look at rent sharing because we have firm financial data that we can link in. Uh, Self-employment, well, we're going to get access to HMRC data soon, so we can bring that into the picture. Uh, and then we're also working uh, towards extending to this linkage to 2021 census as well. So I'll finish there because I know I went over time. I was trying to get a lot. Not, in. not really, so, Carl. Showcase, that was, that, showcase our project. Pretty much perfect. Thanks. I can't see any questions in the actual Q and A's, but I've got two to start us off. First of all, well, when can people get your data? And then the second one is: to what extent can we infer anything about assortative matching between high wage? firms and high wage workers from the movement in the coefficients effect with and without the firm fixed effects? I suspect the answer is nothing, but you've sort of invoked that in the narrative a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I'll answer the first question first. So um, access to the data, I believe you can already order it on the catalog uh, with the ONS Secure Research Service. It'll be accessed through there. However, even though you can order it, it doesn't exist yet, actually. Um, so I believe it's going to be available by, early, uh, by about July, June, July, early summer. I think it's the current schedule. Um, on the second question, I'm hoping there aren't any macro labor economists here because I always try to verge very well away from these issues of sorting and positive assortative matching. And because the extent to which you're able to identify those things from wage, wage data gets very murky. Um, yeah, no, that's a very tough question, Alex, um, and, and we'll, we'll have to think about that. Believe it. Because we've, really, we've not really got any mobility yet in the model, have we? Or in, the, in these data, because we're not even using any of the panel of the ASH, which we could use. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess the broader question, and we should open it up to see whether any of the other speakers have anything to say, is the extent to which we know anything at all about ethnic sorting into different sorts of firms. I mean, we know about the correspondence studies regarding um, hiring discrimination, but um, it's not clear to me that that tells us about, for example, heterogeneity with respect to the propensity of different firms to discriminate, for example. Um, and, and it's not clear to me what preferences people from different ethnic groups might have regarding firm traits. I mean, what we do know from from, from the literature is that there is a preference for more tolerant employers to avoid 
um, discrimination, taste-based discrimination, and that plays out in some studies, and we see that in sexual orientation studies as well, but that's a big question for this sort of project, isn't it? I might come on to that when I speak in a moment, in a moment but I think basically what we've got here is a big large firm bias for the, for the ethnic minorities, right? Uh, I'll maybe say a bit more about that when I talk, but I think um, just by the nature of how employment is structured, I think you have a higher share of employment for ethnic minorities in large firms. And I think large firms tend in general to be more tolerant and more organized on equality issues. So I think that probably works on the, uh, in terms of where ethnic minority workers might seek to uh, end up being employed. And I think, you know, we, we know about the, the large firm uh, wage literature. So I think that could be part of it that's worth teasing out. But I mean, my, uh, Carl, in your presentation, the, the, the firm fixed effect is almost always above the line, right? It's almost always working positively for the ethnic minorities. Um, There's no not in, yeah. not in that case. Okay, that's yeah. the, the exception. But in the other, I think it's usually above the line. Yeah. And then the, the coefficients effect is usually below the line. Yeah. Yeah. There's a question in the room. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, given what was said about sorting into firms, like um, how should I interpret your results given that like if you think about, you know, part of part of the wage gap is that, you know, people select into different firms, right? Mm -hmm. So um, so I'm a bit unclear about like why we should interpret it with the fixed effects instead of without, since we might think that, well, if you would just want a picture of, you know, whether ethnic minorities are worse off, it makes more sense to consider it without the firm fixed effects, because it, that would also consider the sorting into the firms. And it might be the case that, you know, they face a lot of discrimination and therefore they can only sort to like low performing firms and that's part of the disadvantage. Sure, but we can't, without the firm, because we don't know whether it is with, as opposed to between versus within firm aspect, right? So once you've got the firm in there and the firm doesn't account for anything, then we know it's all within firm, right? No, it's not because people work for different firms. Um, but you can sort of like decompose it, I guess, like... You could if we use the panel. Right, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's the other point I was going to ask is that um, in comparison to the, this is like similar to like this about Kumar's Magolis yeah. literature. And the difference here is that that literature is the identification of the fixed effects comes from the movement, but here sure. you have no movement. No. So this how is, should we think about identification in this framework? So I would not. Okay. <laughs> I, would, I would put this in the, in, the, in the guise of a much more descriptive okay. exercise. And um, why I was very, I tried to call it the firm average residual wage that's fixed okay. across employees within the firm. I wouldn't think of it as the like the Bauer Kramerats, I can never pronounce it, AKM model, where it's identified from firm switching. Yeah, I would never. In, 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 the, in, a, in the spirit of descriptives, and we should come on to John in a minute, there are two questions in, in the chat, as I call it. The one is uh, two other observables. Is there anything Tanya Wilson asks about? knowing whether ethnic minority groups are more likely to sort into larger firms. And secondly, there's a question about, can we say anything about the role of unionization in these data? And we know we can do a little bit, don't we, Carl, because of the ASH collective bargaining yep. type variable. Yeah, so I alluded to it at the end, we can partial out those effects, big firms, small firms, private sector, unionized firms, et cetera. We can partial that out from the firm component uh, and we're going to do that by the time we come to putting this paper out. And we haven't looked, have we, at whether or not there's a differential propensity for ethnic minority workers to work in larger firms? Uh, no. no. Okay, so that's that could be something we could look at. Okay, thanks very much indeed, Carl. I think we should move on finally then to John Forth, who's also going to be talking about the role of the employer, but this time more the workplace, the role of the workplace in the ethnic wage gap. Thanks very much, Alex. You can hear me okay and see the slides? Perfect, John, yeah. Great, thank you. So this is a paper with Nikos Theodoropoulos at the University of Cyprus and Alex, who of course is on the line. Yeah, again, looking at the 
role of the workplace in ethnic wage differentials, but you'll see there's quite a different slant to the one that Carl has presented uh, just previously. So why is that not moving? Ah, here we go. Okay. So as Carl has indicated, uh, whilst household surveys can tell us an awful lot about the ethnic wage gap, they have uh, relatively little to say about the role of the firm or the workplace. They can tell us about industry wage uh, differences, region, and so on. Um, but they have less to say about these uh, two important channels. So one might be this between workplace segregation. So uh, maybe if ethnic minorities and whites are segregated into different sorts of workplaces that could contribute to the wage gap, and it could work to the advantage or the disadvantage of ethnic minorities. If we look at the literature on the gender wage gap, we tend to find there that segregation uh, widens the wage gap. So women are disproportionately allocated into lower wage firms. So that makes the, the wage gap even bigger than it is uh, just within firm. But then uh, there can also, of course, be these within workplace wage setting processes, which can also contribute to the ethnic wage gap, as Carl was just uh, alluding to. And there's good survey evidence that uh, there are issues about wage setting within workplaces. So uh, a couple of uh, instances here, Wheatley and Gifford is a CIPD survey. Uh, Heath and Chung also have some evidence which show that ethnic minorities are more likely than white employees to feel that they've been treated unfairly uh, by their employer or their manager. And of course, we know that there are numerous cases where ethnic minority employees take successful complaints to the employment tribunal. So there obviously are issues in terms of the wage setting process as well. And it's interesting, I think, to try and get a better understanding of the uh, importance of these different uh, elements, what you might call segregation or what you might call wage setting, because they, uh, I think they seem to have different policy responses. If we find that the segregation of ethnic minorities and whites into different types of workplaces is a major part of the ethnic wage gap, then that would suggest that we need to put increased efforts into combating hiring discrimination or uh, different employees' choices of who to work for. Whereas if we find that most of the wage gap actually is within the workplace, so the disproportionate uh, segregation doesn't really factor into the wage gap at all, it's mostly within, then that suggests we want to put more effort into uh, addressing uh, differences in wage setting between ethnic minorities and whites. So the kind of questions that we try to address then in this paper, are ethnic minorities disproportionately represented in high or low wage workplaces? Carl has already presented a little bit of evidence on that already. Is there still an ethnic wage gap once we account for these, this disproportionate uh, or differential segregation? So we'll take the same kind of approach to Carl's paper. We'll identify workplace specific uh, wage effects. We'll try and take those out of the ethnic wage gap to see whether a gap still exists, what you might call within the workplace. Is there evidence then consistent with employer discrimination against ethnic minorities in wage settings? So can we, if we see a wage gap that uh, is existing within the workplace between observationally equivalent co-workers, do we have any other circumstantial evidence to suggest that might actually come from discrimination or unequal treatment? And then the final question we'll try to look at is, can we find uh, different uh, sorts of pay setting arrangements where the within workplace wage gap is actually smaller or larger? So um, is this ethnic wage gap within workplace smaller when pay setting is more systematic? And that will help us uh, identify potential uh, policy remedies. So that's where we're going to go across these four questions, just to give you a preview of what we're going to cover. We're going to look at these issues with linked employer-employee data for Britain. Our data is the Workplace Employment Relations Survey. Uh, what we'll show is there's considerable segregation of employees across workplaces in Britain but ethnic wage penalties are primarily a within workplace phenomenon. So this segregation doesn't really contribute a whole lot. That's actually consistent with uh, a number of other studies done in other countries. So a couple of studies here for the US, uh, one for Canada and one for Brazil, which also find that most of the ethnic wage gap exists within workplace rather than uh, between workplaces. Well, I'll show some evidence that's consistent uh, with 
unequal treatment in the workplace by ethnicity. So we'll see that um, ethnic minorities are less satisfied than their pay with uh, their white than their white co-workers, and also more likely to feel overskilled in their role than whites. And I'll go on to identify two workplace practices that are associated with smaller ethnic wage penalties. So firstly, the recognition of trade unions, uh, often talked about as a sword of justice uh, in pay setting in the workplace, and also the use of formal job evaluation schemes. So those are schemes which seek to evaluate the comparable worth of different roles uh, within a firm and set pay uh, according to the role's value. So in a sense, trying to take the individual out of pay setting. So that's where we're headed over the next little while. Um, and where we'll get to is to uh, the kind of policy conclusion that we should be looking to place more emphasis on ensuring fairness in wage determination. So the data is linked employer employee data from the British Workplace Employment Relations Survey. We're going to use three waves of that survey. It's cross-sectional, so we have three cross-sections that we're going to pull. Those cross-sections come from 1998, 2004, and 2011. There's been no more recent iteration of this survey, so we uh, stop at 2011. What you get in each wave of that survey is um, a survey of around 2,000 workplaces each time, so we've got around 6,000 workplaces in total. The size threshold for entry into the survey does vary, so it was workplaces with 10 or more employees in 1998, but five and more employees in 2004 and 2011. We essentially ignore that and just pull um, these three cross sections, even though there's a slightly different size threshold. In that survey, there's an interview with an HR manager in each of the participating workplaces, and the HR manager gives uh, information on the composition of the workplace of the workforce. So that includes the share of ethnic minority employees. So we can use that to look at how the share of ethnic minority employees differs across different types of workplace. They also give information on workplace demographics, so the size, ownership, industry, region, and also tell us a bit about the HR practices, so how a wage is set in that workplace. And then we have uh, a linked survey of up to 25 randomly selected employees at each workplace. On average, uh, somewhere between 10 and 15 of those employees tend to respond. And for those employees, we know their ethnicity, so they report on their uh, ethnic group and they use a standard census type question. There are seven groups, as uh, Steve and Carl have already alluded to. Our sample sizes are quite a bit smaller than theirs. So uh, in what I'm going to show you, I'll focus on white versus non-white, but we are going to split by gender, men and women. I have got some uh, a sort of bonus slide where I show some of the uh, results split by ethnicity, and we can look at that uh, if we have time at the end. The employee tells us about their gross wage. They don't give continuous data on their wage. They respond in 14 bands, so they essentially tick a box depending on their uh, gross wage, but they do give us continuous data on their working hours. So we construct a gross hourly wage interval uh, with those data and then choose the midpoint of that interval which has been done in a number of other papers. For the employee then we have job and personal characteristics, so occupation, tenure, education, uh, and so on. We're only looking here at full-time uh, employees. We made that choice because we're aware there's uh, some quite differential selection, particularly for part-time uh, women from some ethnic minority groups. So we're only looking at full-timers. So what we have basically is cross-sectional data from around 50,000 employees in around 6,000 workplaces once we pull these three years together. Okay, so uh, what I'm gonna show you here is uh, some information on the distribution of ethnic minorities across workplaces. Okay, so I want to focus only on the dark blue bar. Don't worry about the other two, we'll come on to those in a moment. But just looking at the dark blue bar, uh, on the uh, y-axis here, what I'm showing you is workplaces and the share of non-white employees in the workplace. So at the top of the graph, we have the share of all workplaces where there are no ethnic minorities. And you can see that's around about 63% of all workplaces have no ethnic minority employees. Then about 25% have an ethnic minority share between one and 9%. 
and those shares get smaller as we go to higher shares of ethnic minorities. Obviously, there are very, very few uh, workplaces where ethnic minorities are the majority of employees in the site. Most workplaces uh, are all white, but uh, what the uh, other bars shows the distribution of employment. So um, although most workplaces are all white, most workplaces are also very small. So actually, uh, when you look at the distribution of ethnicity, uh, because many workplace, many employees are in large workplaces, we do have quite a lot of employment where a white employee has an ethnic minority co-worker and vice versa. So when we look and try and understand the distribution of the blue bars, so what uh, predisposes a workplace to have a higher share of ethnic minorities? It's partly a function of size. So roughly one in 10 employees in the British labor market are an ethnic minority worker. So if you've got a small workplace, the chance of you recruiting at least one ethnic minority is relatively small. Geographical distribution also plays a key part because many ethnic minority employees are focused in uh, urban areas. Once you take account of those two things, there are other factors that um, are associated with the incidence of ethnic minorities within the workplace. So workplaces are more likely to have uh, uh, ethnic minority workers if there's a young workforce, if they uh, have a high percentage of sales staff, and if they're in certain sectors such as hospitality uh, and health. So um, what we can see then is there are a number of different uh, ways in which the distribution of ethnic minorities across workplaces is not random. And if that's associated with these workplace specific wage effects, then it could uh, contribute to the ethnic wage gap. Okay. So what we're going to do is examine the correlation between the share of ethnic minority workers in the workplace and the workplace specific wage premium. So to do that, we're going to first identify the workplace specific wage premium. Excuse me, there's some noise behind me. I'm just trying to get rid of that. Um, we're going to regress employees' gross hourly wages on a set of employee characteristics, so gender, age, qualifications, occupation. We're going to compute the mean residual wage for each workplace, so the average residual across all of the employees who we observe in that workplace. We're going to call that the workplace-specific wage premium, so the workplace component of wages that uh, is contributing to the wage of everybody in that workplace. And I'm going to simply correlate with that with the share of ethnic minorities in the workplace. So we've got this workplace specific residual on the left, and we've got the share of non-white employees on the right. And what we uh, see there in the table at the bottom is there's a positive correlation. So uh, workplaces with higher shares of non-white employees tend to pay higher wages on average. OK, so ethnic minorities are essentially more likely to be found in higher wage workplaces than lower wage workplaces. We have two takes on that. So column one is just a continuous measure of the share non-white at the workplace. In column two, we split that into groups, but essentially the same message from both of those um, regressions. And that's broadly consistent with what Carl showed when we saw that most of his firm uh, fixed effects were above the line uh, rather than below it. OK, so that's a different story to the gender wage gap. As I said, in the gender wage gap, mostly we find that women are um, generally sorted into lower wage workplaces. On average, ethnic minorities in Britain are generally sorted into higher wage workplaces. So then we want to uh, look at the ethnic wage gap within the workplace. So here we're going to the employee level. So we've got employee wages. Uh, each employee is I in workplace J, and we're regressing their uh, wage on an ethnic minority dummy, so a non-white dummy, that's epsilon, a set of employee characteristics, so education, um, age, tenure, occupation, and then a set of workplace characteristics, so the size of the workplace, industry, region, ownership characteristics, and so on. And that's what we see in the, uh, in the first and second column here. So in the first column, we've got unconditional, so raw wage gaps between white and non-white workers. Top panel is men, bottom panel is women. If we focus on male uh, employees, uh, firstly, you'll see that uh, the raw wage gap is about um, 10 percentage points. So non-white employees earn about 10% less than white workers on average for men. 
If we control for um, these employee characteristics and these observable workplace characteristics, that goes to uh, minus 0 0.13, so around about 13%. What we then do in column three is replace the W, the vector of observed workplace characteristics, with a workplace fixed effect. Okay, so then we're also accounting for any unobserved differences between workplaces. And then we get a coefficient of around about minus 11%, uh, percent, which we can interpret as the difference between white and non-white employees once the average wage differences between workplaces have been taken uh, out of the equation. So essentially a within workplace ethnic wage gap. And what we see then for men is that uh, the distribution of male and um, uh, white and non-white employees doesn't really contribute to the ethnic wage gap. Uh, most of the ethnic wage gap is within the workplace. If we then turn to women, you'll see there's no uh, wage gap uh, in the raw data. That's reasonably consistent with what we see in household data. A wage gap, though, does then uh, emerge once we start to condition on factors. And in particular, in column three, we see a within workplace wage gap of around about 7%. It's not as big as the uh, wage gap for men, but it certainly uh, is there and is statistically significant. Okay. Only about 15 minutes, okay? Thank you, yeah. So if we observe then that there looks to be uh, an ethnic wage gap that's not about the distribution of employees across different workplaces, but seems to be between observationally equivalent co-workers, to what extent might that be uh, explained by the unequal treatment of whites and non-whites in the workplace? Well, one uh, alternative explanation to unequal treatment might be that it's a uh, somehow a compensating wage differential. Maybe there are other elements of the reward package where I think minorities do better than white workers. And indeed, there's some evidence of that from the literature. Bond and Lehman have a paper in Labour Economics where they suggest that some ethnic minorities might trade off lower wages for more employment security. So what we do is we have data in our survey on um, employees' satisfaction with their pay and uh, a number of other uh, measures of job quality. So uh, extent to which they have training, uh, job security, autonomy, and so on. And what we do here then is we're regressing the employee's satisfaction with their pay on the pay that they receive and then other indicators of their job quality. And we do that with and without workplace fixed effects. So looking at columns one and two, what we're trying to say here is if we control for the wage, and we also control for other elements of job quality, so how much training the employee says they get, how much autonomy they say they have in the job, how much job security um, they say they have, how intensely they say they have to work. If we try and control for all of those things, um, if the lower wages of ethnic minorities were simply being um, like a compensating wage differential for better treatment on these other things, we would expect to see that whites and non-whites would have the same level of satisfaction with their wage. But in fact, we see that non-white employees are less satisfied with their wages after taking these other facets of the uh, reward package into account. In columns three and four, we do that in a different way. So instead of trying to include indicators of the amount of training they get or the amount of autonomy, we use the employee's responses to how satisfied they are with those non-pay dimensions. So their satisfaction with the level of autonomy they've got, the satisfaction with training, satisfaction with job security. And you'll see, we see broadly the same result. Uh, whichever way we control for the rest of the reward package, uh, non-white employees are less satisfied with their pay than white employees. And that would be consistent with unequal treatment in uh, wage setting. We have another way of uh, looking at that. We also look at the extent to which employees think they might be overskilled for their job. So if you imagine that um, maybe an ethnic minority employee is being paid less than, um, they, uh, than an equivalent white uh, worker, they might be more likely then to report that they have more skills than they're being, uh, being used in their job. In a sense, overskilled for the role given uh, all the other aspects of the role, including its pay. So we take that perception, they're asked, uh, employees in this survey, uh, to what extent do you think your skills 
are either higher or the same or lower than what are needed for your job. And we look at the extent to which employees report that they are overskilled. So my skills are much higher or a bit higher than needed for my current job. We're controlling then here for other elements of the job like occupation, we're controlling for education, uh, we're controlling for age, we're controlling for workplace characteristics. And after controlling for those various things, uh, non-white employees are more likely to report that they think they are overskilled, that their skills are much higher um, than needed for the job than our white uh, employees who are observationally equivalent. And again, that result uh, stays when we uh, replace the workplace observables with the workplace fixed effects. So in a sense, within the workplace, uh, non-white employees are less likely than their, uh, more likely, sorry, than their white co-workers to report that they are overskilled for their job. So we've got a within workplace ethnic wage gap. We've got uh, evidence that employees are less satisfied with their pay if they're an ethnic minority, and um, they seem to be more likely to report that they're overskilled for their job. So circumstantial evidence that these pay gaps might at least in part be about unequal treatment. So then the final thing we do is to try and look to see if we can find some workplace practices that might be associated with smaller ethnic wage, ethnic wage gaps. In particular, if there's some sort of idiosyncratic component to the wage setting process, we might expect these ethnic wage gaps to be smaller when workplaces have methods of pay setting that are, if you like, more systematic. And we look, uh, or at least present, uh, three different um, pay setting uh, features, if you like, that can uh, exist within workplaces. So firstly, we look at workplaces that recognize unions for pay bargaining, and we compare the ethnic wage gaps in those workplaces with the ethnic wage gaps in workplaces where unions aren't recognized. Secondly, we have some data in the survey where the employer is asked about their equal opportunities practices. So do they have an equal opportunities policy and so on? And then we focus in particular on one of the practices they're asked out about. And they're asked whether the, uh, as an employer, they routinely uh, review relative pay rates by ethnicity. So, so do they relatively uh, monitor the pay rates given to white and ethnic minority employees. So we can uh, compare workplaces that do that with workplaces that don't. And then and you've thirdly- had, you've had we, 20 minutes, by the way, just okay. so that you know. Yep, just coming into land. And then finally, we look at workplaces with a formal job, job evaluation scheme. Is the ethnic wage gap smaller in those sorts of workplaces? Uh, we, so what we're doing here is we're taking a workplace practice, we're entering that into the employee level wage equation, and we're interacting it with the uh, non-white dummy. So I'm going to go through this uh, table uh, relatively quickly. What we've got, um, just to show you in the first two columns, is in column one we've got an OLS equation, so it's a wage, an employee wage equation controlling for employee observables and workplace observables, and you'll see We've got um, a dummy for non-white employees. We've got a dummy for workplaces that recognize unions. And then we've got an interaction between the two. So the non-white dummy here, the coefficient of minus 1.142, uh, is showing us that non-white employees earn around 14% less than white employees in workplaces where unions aren't recognized. And then the interaction term, the 0 0.069, is showing us that that wage penalty is reduced by about seven percentage points in workplaces which recognize unions. And you can see that broad pattern of results stays when we replace the workplace uh, observables with workplace fixed effects. Columns three and four then look at the practice of reviewing relative pay rates by ethnic background, and there's no statistically significant interaction term uh, in that um, specification. And then columns five and six repeat the same thing with formal job evaluation. And again, you'll see we get a positive and statistically significant interaction term down in the bottom of the table. So in workplaces that have formal job evaluation, the um, ethnic wage gap is around six, seven percentage points smaller than in workplaces without formal job evaluation. Now, in those six columns, we're only entering the practices one by one, but in the final columns, seven and eight, we enter them all together. We can focus on column eight, that's the one with 
the workplace fixed effect. And we see that in workplaces with uh, recognized unions, the ethnic wage gap is around four percentage points smaller than it is in workplaces without. And then going down to the bottom of the table, equally in workplaces with formal job evaluation systems, the ethnic wage gap is around about four percentage points smaller than in workplaces without job evaluation. So just to recap, we've got linked employer employee data here trying to look at the role of the workplace in ethnic wage gaps. We find there is a lot of segregation of employees across workplaces, in particular, a large bias towards large workplaces. But the ethnic wage penalty still seems to be mostly a within workplace phenomenon, and, and that's very similar to what's been found in other countries. We present some evidence that's consistent with unequal treatment. So ethnic minorities are less satisfied with their pay than whites after conditioning on variety of other uh, factors. And ethnic minorities also more likely to feel overskilled in their roles than white co-workers. And then we identify two workplace practices that seem to be associated with smaller ethnic wage penalties. So the recognition of trade unions, and we can look there to the literature on unions as a sword of justice, putting, uh, trying to ensure that wages are tied to observable um, factors of uh, um, employee skill. And also the use of job evaluation schemes, which try to evaluate the comparable worth of different roles and tie wages to their uh, the job's uh, value rather than to individuals. And so in summary, we would say that uh, this evidence suggests more attention should be placed on ensuring fairness in wage determination. And that's where I'm gonna stop. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you very much, John. We have a question in the chat, which is pushing back on the idea that you said at one point that your results were consistent with Carl's. The person is asking whether or not, in fact, Carl was saying that taking account of uh, selection into firms is really important in understanding the gap, whereas you're saying it's really mainly about the within uh, workplace uh, variance. What, what would you have to say to that? I think it, it partly depends where you start from. So if I go, uh, uh, if we go back to what Carl was showing, there are very heterogeneous wage gaps for different ethnic minority groups, okay? And I think what Carl showed is that generally, his firm fixed effect was above the line. Yep. So mostly that firm effect is masking what is effectively for most groups are within workplace wage penalty. So I think you get a similar message across those two presentations. In Carl's presentation, most of his coefficients red lines were underneath the, the axis. OK, so that what I would say is there's huge heterogeneity in the raw gaps. A lot of that is about firm. But actually, for most ethnic minorities, um, there is a within workplace wage penalty. And I could show, uh, I didn't show you the heterogeneity. But yeah, I think it, it, it depends in a part where you're, where you're starting from. And obviously, with Carl's data, he's able to split it up uh, into different ethnic minority groups. And if I showed you those um, statistics where we have split it up, you would see that the workplace matters differently for different groups, but there is a within workplace wage penalty for most of the groups, uh, I think in, in either uh, analysis ultimately. Okay, very useful. Carl, tell me if there's any questions in your room. Meanwhile, I have one obvious- Carl might one. want to disagree. I'll give oh. him right of reply. Okay. <laughs> I, think, I think it's just heterogeneity, right? We, we, I, can, I, can, I can show you the results for the mean from our stuff. I just didn't present them. And at the mean, across all, it's going to look very similar to what John says. OK, that's really useful. John, one obvious question is you've pushed a little bit on the, the policy inferences, but of course, job evaluation schemes and union recognition yeah. are not randomly assigned across ethnic minorities. So what would you say to that? Yeah, and not, and not likely to be prescribed either by policymakers, but um, to the extent that our analysis suggests that there are um, ethnic wage gaps amongst observ observationally equivalent co-workers within workplace, it, it seems to be that a lot of this ethnic wage penalty is coming from the wage setting process. So anything then that policymakers can do to encourage employers to look at their wage setting processes more carefully than they have done, would be beneficial. I and mean, there are many 
I mean, there are not many, but there are different ways policymakers could encourage employers to do that. Transparency might be one. We've seen that that's been somewhat effective on the gender wage gap. Um, you know, policymakers haven't told employers necessarily how to set wages for men and women, but um, by going through the gender pay gap reporting process, they've um, encouraged a lot of employers to look a bit more carefully at their wage statistics than they would otherwise have done. There have been a lot of people pushing for ethnic pay gap reporting. In fact, I think the government recently said they're not going to do that, um, which I think is un unfortunate, actually. Oh, I didn't know that. OK, I thought they were still consulting on that. So that's I didn't realise. Um, let's let's now in the last couple of minutes, I'm still looking at the Q&A stuff in case somebody pops something in. But perhaps um, you'd like to reflect on one another's uh, thoughts a little bit. Um, we've got a couple of minutes to go. Steve, have you got any thoughts on what you've heard from the others? Well, I was just actually picking up on just what John said there about reporting the ethnic pay gap. I mean, one of the, I don't necessarily agree, but the pushback on it is it's not similar uh, equivalent to doing the gender pay gap, where it's almost 50 50. It's like statistically, you can mm. have an outlier. But like in your, the, the distribution that you were mm. showing, you know, you can have some firms where there are no, no ethnic minorities or one. So it's not reporting equivalent thing. Would you say that? almost the argument is that just having the mechanism in itself is would act to change firm behavior in terms of wage setting well i guess um what i suppose what's what you want to do is to is probably to push firms who wouldn't ordinarily look at their wage data mm -hmm. to do i mean actually we we've got this indicator in a survey of whether uh, employers have been reviewing their relative pay rates and those that do it doesn't seem to make a, a lot of difference so that might be an argument for saying well look you know transparency is pointless I mean of course transparency is pointless unless you do something about it isn't it there's no point collecting the statistics unless you then go and try and ask the question why but um, I think one one thing that uh, the, the gender pay gap reporting process has done is enabled people outside the firm to, to apply pressure. Now, I accept what mm. you're saying. With ethnicity, that's more difficult because mm -hmm. you do have some uh, issues around, you know, what you can publish without giving away people's salaries. Yes. But I, I, for large firms, I think that's not a huge problem, right. actually. We should ask Carl for a final word, but remember everybody, if you want to get in touch with these people directly, I think they've all left their contact details on the platform so you can follow up afterwards. Carl, any final thoughts? Well, the evidence from the gender pay gap reporting literature that's coming out so far based on the, is that it, did have, it has, does appear to reduce the gender wage gap. And the, the problem was because they set the threshold so low, which is great, of course, but for us as researchers, that memory, I don't think has been able to identify whether that happened within the firm or just you know, as an aggregate effect, so, you know, people moving across firms, you know, people becoming aware. Um, so if they, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to say whether it gets at what John's finding in the results, right? Whether the pay gap reporting even addresses that because it could be, you know, awareness by the work of the workers themselves that there are pay gaps with their own firm precipitates them, well, I'm not staying here then. Yeah. You know, if I see that nobody in higher management now is is is, is female, I'm not staying. Yeah. Uh, particularly, my, my my thought about this is that if you believe correspondence studies, there's a lot of hiring discrimination by ethnicity going on in Britain, and it's been constant ever mm. since the introduction of the Race Relations Act. And so this raises interesting questions. There are a bunch of intolerant employers out there, so there will be probably sorting by firm according to perceived tolerance of employers and therefore employer signaling um, is going to matter for the sorting of workers. I also assume that if, if there is some discrimination on the hiring front, it's liable to occur in the wage setting domain as well. But of course, we haven't been able to say anything directly on that today. Anyway, we've run out of time. Thanks very much, you guys. I thought that was actually a terrific um session i really enjoyed it and uh, don't forget you can listen back to it because it's been recorded so thanks very much everyone thank you Bye. thanks alex for sharing
Thanks, Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Thanks. Bye. Bye.